over to dr priyansh thank you over thank to you thank you so much uh, so good afternoon to all uh, first i want to confirm few things is i am audible to you and my screen is visible so we can see you okay so i will request everybody please pin my video to your screen so that you will able to see what uh, i am teaching about so uh, today as far as our lecture is concerned we are going to see how we are going to characterize our modified and unmodified binder so actually this should be in another way it should be the characterization of unmodified and a modified binders because always we will start modification by using a unmodified binder and uh, second thing that uh, i want you people to understand about what kinds of loading we are going to have uh, when we have any uh, binders uh, or the infrastructure or any material made up from the binder so the one loading everybody knows is the loading what what we are going to get from the vehicle or the kind of stress or strain now the second type of loading in case of binder is the temperature so if temperature is increases binder will become fluid its load taking capacity will decrease if it is very less temperature then also binder will become brittle third thing is time the same load if we apply for a longer amount of time that will also act as a load on the binder so load with time gives you rate of loading so i will call it as a rate of loading so binders performance will depend upon temperature rate of loading and what amount of load you have so these are all the parameters what we will will see so do you people understand means why this rate of loading is uh, important so in order to demonstrate that the temperature we have already seen if you increase the temperature binder will become more fluid and the load taking capacity will decrease if you decrease the temperature binder will become brittle that we have seen through different testing now can have you ever um, realize means what will happen if we increase or decrease the rate of loading because the way we are loading in different test of characterization we are using as per ias where we have a, a load rate standardization but not directly it is inherited in the code so if you want to see directly i will try to show you or demonstrate you by using a simple clay material so this is the clay material i i think it's visible to you so let's suppose let's i'm trying to load this material and i will keep the rate of loading with a very less so what's going to happen is the simple what we you will see in the ductility test this is the kind of thing you will see and if in fact now i am not applying any load but the material is again elong getting elongated by its own weight now let's try to increase the rate of loading on the same material suppose i am applying the load now with a very higher rate now what happened the material behaved like a brittle material and it got cracked the same load i am applying once with a very slow rate and the second time i am applying with a very high rate so this is actually the critical thing when you characterizing a binder and this things make polymer modified binder more performing as compared to the modified binder because of the what mo modification of what additive they have that gives more elastic nature to the binder that make the binder more better performing in the lower temperature range or when you have the higher rate of loading so let's now begin with the time, uh, begin with this presentation so today what we'll see that will be uh i am restricting that discussions uh, uh, in accordance with the two quotes the is 73 2013 which is already got reaffirmed in 2018 now so this is the quote mostly referred for uh, uh, i will say unmodified binder although all the binder which should be used for modifications should also confirm this is 73 2013 and then we'll go to this uh, we'll take uh, account this is 15462 uh, which got uh, published in 2019 so this code is basically a revision or i it's i will not call it as a revision uh, because it's a purely different code from its 2014 version now this code only address about the polymer modified binder this code doesn't discuss about the crumb rubber modified or natural rubber modified binders so because uh, now is has decided to come up with a new code which could uh, 
take account of those crumb rubber modified binder because from the fundamental uh, fundamentally these two additives behaves very differently when they being added on the binder so let's try to relate first the binder performance with different type of testing and why we want to characterize the binder so normally binder what we you see as a bitumen that bitumen have more than 200 type of uses you can use the bitumen on the roof work you can use the bitumen on the building works so always when we want to characterize something we want to see whether that binder or that material is fair enough or will perform well or not if it is being used for that work so because we are in the we as a payment engineer we will try to check our binder whether this binder is going to perform good enough when it will be used in the pavement or not. So let's see now the pavement is going to have different different temperature during its life. That would be uh, negative temperatures when temperature or the air temperature is very low. It may be a temperature range of 25 degrees Celsius, which is a mean temperature in India. It could be uh, 60 degree or for, let's suppose 55 to 60 degrees Celsius at the extreme summer climate. Again, when you are making your payment or constructing your payment, maybe the temperature around 130, 145 degrees Celsius. Also, when you are heating your binder, maybe a temperature of around 200 or something like that when you are heating your aggregate and binder. So the overall temperature range, if you see for the binder, which he is, um, uh, which it is going to experience in the field, is ranges from maybe some, uh, maybe from zero to up to 220 or maybe 200 degrees Celsius. Now, in this wide range of temperature, binder will act as a different different materials by its physical state. So, if you see the binder's state when the temperature is very less, so it will behave like an elastic solid. If you increase the temperature, it will start behaving like a viscoelastic solid. If you still increase the temperature, let's suppose we reach at the 90 degrees Celsius, it will attain a state of uh, a free flowing state or uh, you can say as a viscous liquid. And if you again increase the temperature, let's suppose we reach at 150 or 165 degrees Celsius, then you will see a true solid. So because it's a state depending upon the temperature and this temperature, we are going to experience a different parts when uh, your payment will be in service. So let's try to see which temperature can uh, see which kind of uh, problems or which kind of issues in the pavement. So if we have very less amount of temperature in the pavement, we can see a thermal cracking. You might have seen this kind of cracking in the temperature uh, in the pavement, which is caused by the low temperature. Now this low temperature, actually I'm talking about the temperature. It might be minus 10, minus five, or maybe zero degrees Celsius. Now, if you go in mid range of temperature, maybe around 25 degrees Celsius or average range of temperature, in this range of temperature, your pavement will experience a fatigue cracking. Uh, this is the picture uh, showing your fatigue cracking. It will look like an alligator screen. Uh, if you reach to the higher maximum service temperature, let's suppose it's around 60 degrees Celsius, your pavement may uh, experience rutting or showing. So rutting is a kind of permanent deformation along the wheel paths and showing is a plastic deformation you will see in the form of ripples. And if you further increase, that will be representative of your, uh, your production temperatures. But that means when you are mixing or compacting your mix. Uh, that time, if you uh, make your uh, 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 binders uh, at very high temperature, if you maintain your binder at very high temperature, the binder will drain down from the mixture. Mix will not capable enough to keep that binder uh, in order to formulate the better mix. So that's uh, if binder viscosity is very high, the binder will start leaving your mixture. So that is known, known as drain down. Uh, apart from this, the binder, uh, the binder which you are going to use will experience different, different aging condition during the service life of the pavement. So the first condition, when you are just you started using your binder or just procure your binder, then that condition is known as when your binder is not aged or unaged. Now the second condition is when you have used your binder, you make it, uh, you poured it, then you have heated it, now you have mixed it, and now you're preparing for compaction. So till this time, your binder will get aged, 
and this is actually the simulation this is uh, known as actually short term easing and this simulation is being done in lab by using a thin film oven or by using a rolling thin film oven test so this both the test actually simulates the short term aging which occurs in the field apart from that uh, so actually these are the testing methodologies uh, should i uh, discuss the testing methodologies as well or i should suppose that this is the normal thing uh, i should leave may i get some response okay so let's little bit uh, discuss about the testing protocol also so the thin film so thin film oven is actually a methodology to simulate this short term aging which occurs in the field so here what we are going to do we are going to have a small pans in the small pans we are going to pour some amount of okay we are going to pour some amounts of binder in these plates you i think you are able to see these plates the small plates we'll pour some amounts of binder in this uh, plates now we'll keep this plates in this oven now this oven is a special type of oven which has a rack now in this rack you will keep your plates and this rack will start rotating with an speed of 5 to 6 rpm now when this rack is rotating in this direction what happens the binder you poured here in this plate will make a thin film on that plate and because this is the aerated oven so the air will come in contact of this binder during this rotation process and during this test you have to maintain a temperature of 325 degree fahrenheit or 163 degree celsius you have to keep the binder inside this oven and rotate it at the standard temperature till 5 hours of time after that you will take out the binder that binder will be short term aged means that is simulating the binder when you have make your mix and you have compacted your mix so till this process what amount of aging will occur that binder will be aged by that amount same test is being done by using the uh, rolling thin film oven test as well here the difference is that here we can minimize the time of testing as compared to 5 hours in the previous case here this test in the short duration of 85 minutes only testing temperature will remain same and why we are able to reduce the time by using some more uh, sophisticated way of introducing the air inside the oven there you have seen we have just put a binder in a container or in a plates there we have generated a short or thin film of the binder here rather than that we will use some cylindrical bottle and here we'll put uh, those bottle in this rack this rack will rotate vertically in this direction rather than horizontal direction what we have seen and during this rotation one air nozzle will blow a hot air inside these bottles now what happens if you have this type of bottle and this rack is rotating by this action the binder accumulated inside this uh, bottles will also rotate now due to that ro rotation you will able to get a very thin film of the binder throughout this bottle surface this is the picture of the bottle you can see here this is the rack if you put this bind uh, this binder this container inside the rack and you rotate it in this direction because of this rotation you will able to find the small thin film of the binder and then you will blow is hot air inside these containers that air will make your binder age and because of this accelerated action from the nozzle and uh the thin film what we are obtaining from this using this containers or cylindrical containers will able to minimize the time as compared to 5 hours in the previous case only 85 minutes in the case of rtf40 after short term in the pavement service life again the binder get aged this aging occurs because of the oxidation process now this could be the case of in service life of many years maybe after 5 uh, years or 8 years of pavement service life 
This is being simulated by using a, a, a apparatus called pressure easing vessel. So in order to understand this pressure easing, easing vessel, uh, vessel, just imagine your pressure cooker. So if you want to make dal chawal, you will use pressure cooker. Why it's working with the pressure? Uh, why it's working there? <laughs> why this uh, rice uh, is cooking uh, in a short duration as compared uh, in pressure cooker as compared to the normal process or normal cooking? So this is because the pressure cooker is going to elevate the boiling point. Now, the boiling point of water is only 100 degrees Celsius. If you try to cook something inside the water normally, then it cannot transfer heat more than 100 degrees Celsius to that food. But if you use pressure cooker, you will elevate that boiling point. Now, maybe the boiling point of water may be elevated up to 150 degrees Celsius. What will happen at that point? Now, water will able to transfer the heat of around 150 degrees Celsius to the food. And that's how the pressure cooker will able to cook the food more rapidly as compared to the normal cooking process. Same thing will happen in this pressure aging vessel as well. Here we'll use a small pans. We'll pour our binder in this small pans. We'll put them in this container and we'll apply a pressure in this container. This will be the amount of pressure we will apply by using the air and will maintain a temperature of 90 to 100 degrees Celsius for a duration of 20 years, sorry, 20 hours. So this will simulate a aging of the binder in the years of service life of the pavement. Let's see what are the characterization testing available now. So what we have seen, we have seen what are the different type of uh, temperature ranges we have with the binder and we have already seen what are the different type of aging our binder will go through in its service life. Let's try to relate with the, uh, the type of temperatures we have seen with the testing which can be done. So if we go for average service temperature, so here you will see a test called penetration number or penetration test simply. In the mean service temperature, you will see a test called absolute viscosity test, or you can say softening point as well. At the temperature of mixing and compaction, you will see a test called kinematic viscosity. Minimum service temperature, you might have heard some test called frost breaking tip point. Let's see what these tests are. So penetration test, so simply this is a sim, uh, to measure the consistency of the binder or it's an indirect measurement of the viscosity of the binder at 25 degrees Celsius temperature or at some standard temperature, whatever, because it depends upon the specification and that may vary from country to country. So in this test, we'll have a standard weight and that weight we will apply to the binder by some standard needle for some standard duration of time. In India, we have a standard temperature of 25 degrees Celsius for the binder. In that temperature, we'll put 100 gram of the load by a needle on the binder surface and let them penetrate the binder for a duration of five seconds. After the five second time, we will measure how much penetration of the needle has occurred. And that penetration value uh, in tenth of millimeter is taken as the penetration value. Second test is the flash and fire point test. So basically this is the safety test. What happens when you are going to heat your binder in the field? Maybe accidentally you can heat your binder maybe higher at higher temperatures, maybe at 240, uh, maybe 250 or 300. What will happen at that higher elevated temperature? This binder may catch as fire. Now that will be accidental condition for the people who is working with this binder in the field. In order to avoid that condition, we have to give a maximum temperature. Above that, we should not heat the binder at any condition. This is being tested by using a uh, simple operators, uh, uh, maybe a open cup type or a closed cup, cup, uh, cup type uh, operators. Here we'll put our binder and we will start heating our binder to the elevated temperature at some standard rate of heating. And uh, at certain certain instances, we will expose fire to this binder and we will measure the temperature as well. The point or the temperature at which this binder will catches fire, that point is known as flash point. 
Uh, next type of test is a ductility test. So normally this test you can perform on the neat binder also and you can perform this test on the short term age binder as well because this test is related with the aggregate binder scotability over the aggregate. So normally this is the standard kind of bracket in which you will put your sample and then you will load your sample in a ductility machine or ductilometer. And here you will try to stretch these two parts or these two edges of the bracket by some standard rate. And you need to measure this distance until this binder is not breakable. It should not break, it should in the form of a small thin thread. And this distance is known as ductility well. Then you might have a few more testing, maybe absolute viscosity. So what absolute viscosity is? Uh, uh, if a fluid with a viscosity of one pascal is placed between two standard plates, uh, uh, so if I take these two standard states, so basically I'm explaining you uh, the viscosity by using two plate model. So this is actually a two plate model. So if you have a standard two plate and you apply a tau of one unit and your plate moves by one unit, then you will have the viscosity in this fluid as one. The unit of absolute viscosity uh, uh, is Pascal second or you can say poise or centipoise. Similarly, there's one more, vis uh, sorry. So let's see how to measure this viscosity. So normally this absolute viscosity is being measured using uh, capillary viscometer. So this is the kind of tube you might have seen. So using this tube, we will measure the viscosity or absolute viscosity of the binder. So this is popular tube in the India. So let's discuss how we'll uh, measure the viscosity using this Canon Manning viscometer tube. So in this test, first thing is you require a binder. You will pour your binder through this edge in this tube. And you will fill the binder up to this filling mark. Then you will keep this binder inside a water bath or inside a heating bath at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius or whatever the testing temperature you require. And then you need to apply certain amount of vacuum from this side on this tube. Now this vacuum is required because binder doesn't have that amount of fluidity. And here also, if you see, uh, these points are higher in height as compared to the line of filling. So in order to pass these uh, points or these bulbs, you will require excess amount of force to be applied so that your binder can pass these bulbs. So when you will apply this vacuum, the binder will pass these bulbs or these zones. You need to note down the points when binder crosses these bulbs. These times multiplied by the constant of these bulbs will give you its absolute viscosity. Similarly, we have kinematic viscosity, which is a measure of pumpability of the binder, or it's a measure of how good binder is in the mixing in the compaction process. That kinematic viscosity is actually nothing but the absolute viscosity uh, divided by its uh, density. Unit is Stoke, and how to measure that? In the same way what we have seen in the case of absolute viscosity, in the similar way kinematic viscosity, uh, can be measured. Now the kinematic viscosity uh, here, because it's the kinematic and the density of material should play a role in the flowing of this material. So here the flow which is being happened in the previous case by applying vacuum will occur because of the density of the material. So here we'll load our binder in this bulb. Now you see the height difference among these bulbs and this loading bulb. So if you load the binder, the height of binder is higher than these bulbs. That's, that means this binder will able to flow by its own weight. So we'll load the binder here. Again, the same way, we'll, uh, we'll note down the time required to fill these bulbs. So two times you will get T1 and, sorry, T1 and T2 the times multiplied by the corresponding bulb, uh, bulb constants will give you the kinematic viscosity. 
Another test is softening point. So in softening point, you uh, this ring and ball test is uh, most famous. So this is the test actually, uh, which is a representation when a pavement attain a certain amount of viscosity. Now this viscosity is actually uh, a characterization of binder in the higher temperature range. Uh, normally this is the temperature when your binder or when your mix uh, will undergo rutting or showing. So here in this case, you will have your binder on small rings and you will load uh, these balls, this is steel balls or this metal balls having a weight of 3.5 grams and you will, uh, you will load these balls on the rings which contains the binder. Now the temperature when you will begin the test will be 5 degrees Celsius and you will start increasing the temperature as the test, test go on. Now this increase in temperature should be at some standard rate is specified by the specification because this rate of increase in the temperature is go also going to affect the test result. So when you have started increasing the temperature with standard rate, now if temperature is increasing, the binder will become softened and at certain temperature will, uh, at certain temperature, this ball will able to penetrate the binder or this binder will fall because of this ball loading. So the temperature at which this ball touches the lower panel of this frame, that temperature is known as softening point. So if you have performed these many tests, so now we will, we are capable enough to grade our binder as per the IS73. So basically this code is for unmodified binder. So if you are able to perform these many tests, you can grade your binder as an unmodified binder or you can grade your unmodified binder. So here, if you have performed penetration, the penetration result is required, absolute viscosity, kinetic viscosity, flash and fire point, solubility. So this is the purity test. So that's why I haven't discussed this. The softening point and test on the residue, what you opt or test on the binder, what you obtain after short term aging. So these are the many, these many test results you will require to grade your binder in present uh, paving grades. So there are four different grading or paving grades for unmodified binders available in India. That is a VG30, VG20, VG, uh, sorry, VG10, 20, 30, and 40. And this VG grade is basically coming from its viscosity or absolute viscosity measured at 60 degrees Celsius. So for VG10, this viscosity should be at the range of 800 to 1200. And in the same way for VG40, it should be in between 3200 to 4800. Rest, all these tests need to be fulfilled if you want to grade your binder at certain paving grade. So in viscosity grading, we are actually grading our binder or measuring the binder's performance at different, different temperature. In terms of penetration, we are measuring our pavement performance at 25 degrees Celsius or the mean average temperature. In terms of absolute viscosity or softening point, we are measuring our binder's performance at higher temperature. And at the production temperature, we are measuring binder's performance or we are characterizing our binders using kinematic viscosity test. The main thing what we are missing here is the performance at below or very low temperature. That means the thermal cracking criteria. <laughs> so what's the pros of this test? So we are using a fundamental property. That means a viscosity uh, done at maximum service temperature. Also, we have uh, the data regarding maximum service temperature because we are doing tests at 60 degrees Celsius. And also we are doing softening point test includes high and average temperature criteria. So we have this criteria also in bent. What's the cons we have harder to run. We require more expensive equipment to run this test. Doesn't have a long-term aging criteria. That means it gives a characterization of the binder till short-term aging only and don't have any low temperature cracking criteria. But the real issue with this, this type of grading, this is not the issue only till 
IS 73, even after getting our grades, uh, our codes for modified binder also, this is the main issue what I felt we have in the IS codes. The issue is that what we require, we require performance. So we should idealize our binder with respect to performance, but we are idealizing the binder for certain temperatures. We are running the test at certain temperature and we are saying when these performances will be met, that binder will be this grade of binder, let's say VG10 or VG20. So what we are amazing that if we have VG10 or VG30, let's suppose, when it's going to fulfill this criteria, whether it's going to fulfill the criteria at 25 degrees Celsius, at 60 degrees Celsius, at uh, 135 degrees Celsius. So this is not the correct way to test it. Rather, the correct way is to check when the softening point value will be higher than 50 degrees Celsius. And we should get the temperature. So if I have some standard parameter or standard performance criteria, the grading system or the characterization should be to check when this criteria or this performance criteria will met at what temperature. The new approach uh, which is being followed by uh, the new IS code for polymer modified bitumen is working in this aspect. There you will see this thing is taken into the account and rather than testing the making the test on diff, on the same temperature and getting the performance, the stringent performance criteria is being fixed and then checked when this performance criteria will be meet by the binders. Okay, so in the new approach, uh, there are different type of simulation which is being taken into account. So here also we are going to see the binders when we will get binder from the production. That means without any aging, we'll do the short term aging by using maybe TF40 or RTF40. And here at this point, the Indian standards have included the aging in the service life fall. So that means aging from the PAV vessels is also being included now. And in this new code, two performance criteria for rutting and low temperature cracking, cracking is also being taken into the account. Let's see what are the different testing we have more than what we have seen in the case of unmodified binder. So all testing what we have seen in unmodified binder is also valid for the modified binders. Apart from that, what other testing we require to do? So the other testing is the viscosity at high temperature. So mostly this viscosity code specifies that we require a viscosity at 150 degrees Celsius temperature. So this viscosity is being done by using a rotational viscometer. This rotational viscometer actually depends upon or theoretically it's depend upon the two plate theory what definition we have seen. So here one spindle will be there. You can see this is spindle shape and one standard container will be there. You will pour the binder inside this container and then you will lower this spindle inside the binder. Now you, if you concentrate on this uh, spindle surface on this container surface, you will able to identify the two layers what we have seen in the condition of definition of uh, the standard viscosity uh, or absolute viscosity. So now if you try to rotate this spindle in some direction with some standard rate of rotation, this binder will try to resist that rotation. And the amount of resistance if you are able to maintain, measure or if you are able to measure the effort required to rotate this spindle at some constant rate, that effort will give you uh, the viscosity of this material. This is the theory being used in this rotational visco viscometer and that's how this viscosity will be measured. Now this rotational viscometer is capable to measure the binder viscosity at different elevated temperature. Maybe more, uh, maybe means you can measure the binder's viscosity, maybe ranging from 120 to 220 to 50 degrees Celsius. This is more flexible equipment. 
may be by the combination of more type of this spindle shape or spindle geometry you may able to measure the binary viscosity in more bigger range then next type of testing is by using dynamic shear rheometer so here you will have a two plate geometry let's first see how this uh, equipment will look like so this is a dynamic shear rheometer uh, here basically we have two plates so this is the lower plate this is the upper plate this equipment is capable to make the uh, make the constant temperature during the testing also this will apply some shear rate by the rotation of upper plate so here you can see two plate the binder we will load on this plate so if testing wise if you see this is the sample what we are making and this binder testing will go if these are two plate we are going to load our binder here so if this head we rotate this by rotation of this head the binder will experience some amount of load so normally this loading in the test what we are using for binder is a oscillatory oscillatory loading here we can apply the rotating load as well but for the binder uh, whatever the parameter we require to check that requires a oscillatory loading how that oscillatory loading will be this plate will move from a to b then from b to a then from a to c and c to a so something this so this will give you with time if you try to plot this this will give you a sinusoidal wave and that's why we i am saying that this is the oscillatory load so let's see if your material is a elastic material how your stress strain response will be if you are loading uh, your material by some load so let's see this is my loading curve this is the stress i am applying on the material and suppose this is the purely elastic material so the time at which you have applied the load at the same time you will see the strain on the material because for this material will follow hooks law so because of that whatever the stress whatever the time you will apply the stress at the same time immediately you will see some strain originating and when you have removed the strain or your stress becomes zero at the same time the strain will also become zero now what happened to a viscous material now viscous material will behave with an uh, uh, differently than this uh, uh, elastic material and they will have a phase lag so if you have applied the stress at uh, zero time then you are going to have strain originating at some lag of 90 degree phase angle now the vis uh, your binder is behaving like a viscoelastic material so whatever the phase angle you are going to get that is going to be somewhat in between this zero and this 90 degree celsius so the load or the strain will not originate immediately and will be in between this 90 degree phase angle criteria <laughs> so suppose i have loaded my sample or binder in the dsr or dynamic shear rheometer by some load and we have seen that my strain has originated let's suppose at time t2 at t1 i have started applying the load and here the strain is originated at time t2 so this difference is going to give you the phase lag or phase angle which is known as delta and the ratio between the peak to uh, this peak to peak stress upon this peak to peak strain will give you the complex modulus now this complex modulus is a complex quantity why we are associating modulus term here because we are looking for its magnitude so if this is if it is a complex number then it should have two values one absolute and one a complex or imaginary so here similarly to the complex number what we have seen in the mathematics we have two types of values one is the storage modulus or you can say the elastic component and the second one is the viscous modulus or you can say the viscous component 
So this is the real quantity and this is the imaginary quantity. So this uh, value or the complex modulus is actually uh, g dash plus iota times g double dash. And its value or its modulus will give you complex modulus g star. So there are different parameters which could be calculated from this DSR or measuring of uh, this phase angle and G star value. So first parameter is the fatigue parameter or the value of G star sine delta. Now this G star sine delta is very famous parameter for measuring the fatigue performance uh, or the uh, fatigue um, uh, character uh, or to do the fatigue characterization of the binder. Although there are uh, different researches, different points which shows that this parameter is not accurate enough to do so. In IRC also, if you go to the code of 2014 version, you will see this is the criteria being included. And we have started including this criteria from the 2004 onwards. So this is the criteria we have used to uh, capture the fatigue. And similar, one more performance criteria is that, that is for rutting and uh, that is G star by sine delta. Now this both criteria is not accurate because they have very bad correlation with the field rutting and fatigue performance. Now why this criteria are not good enough? Why uh, they are failed to model the performance in the field? The issue is that because when you are testing this G star or phase angle delta, you will apply a very less amount of load to the binder. Now why that less amount of the load? Because if you apply the more amount of load in the binder, your binder will fail. This testing or the testing of this uh, G star or phase angle will require your binder should be in the viscoelastic range. Now, if the strain is very less, now if the strain is very less and uh, you are testing your binder, the binder does not reach to the state where the modifiers or the additive what you have added start performing. Then what happens? At the certain low strain label, what happens? They behave as a filler additive inside the material. They behave in the same way like if you add some filler rock material in the binder and try to test its G star and sign data. What will happen? If you add the fill-in material also, then also it will cause some stiffening of the binder. And same thing is you are going to capture when you measure this G star and sine delta. So there will be no difference if you are going to have filler material or if you are going to have a polymer modifier inside your binder. So that's why this correlation is bad. And instead of this, there are some other tests which can be done. We'll see in our uh, later slides. Now this IS uh, 2019 revision has accommodated uh, those tests. So first is to measure uh, G star by sine delta at unaged. Other test is separate, separation test. So because modified binder is having some mod um, additives, now that additive could be elastomer or a plastomer. And because you are going to use your binder at the elevated temperature, you are going to store your binder as well. So that additives can be separated from your binder medium. Now, in order to check that, this separation test is suggested. So in order to do that, you have to take this standard tubes, aluminum tubes, basically they are, you have to keep your binder, pour your binder inside this tube, and then you have to keep this binder at a temperature of 163 degrees Celsius for 48 hours inside the oven. And after that, you have to freeze these tubes. After freezing, you have to cut these tubes in three different parts. And then you have to measure the whisk, uh, uh, softening point, sorry. You have to measure the softening point of the binder obtained from the top part of the tube and from the bottom part of the tube. And the difference between these two short, uh, um, points or these two softening points should not be more or should be within the specified range in the S code. Other test is the elastic recovery, the similar kind of test what you have seen in the case of duct, uh, unmodified binder, we have conducted a ductility test, the same type of test it is, but here because you are going to have elastomers or plastomers, they are going to improve the elastic part of the binder. Now if elastic part is being improved, binder should be capable to recover 
uh, any deformation or any type of deformation. So in this test, we have a different type of bracket. We will lay, load the bracket in the same way we have loaded in the case of ductility. And then we will load this in the ductility machine or ductilometer. And here this test should be conducted at a 15 degrees Celsius temperature or the specified by the code. And in this test, we are going to stress this material at some standard rate of stretching and we will stretch it up to some standard distance. So this D in case of IS code is 10. This rate of stretching is five centimeter per minute. And after that, you have to just cut down the sample from the middle and then wait for a du standard duration. What will happen if you wait this material because it is having more elastic additives so this material will recover, try to recover its shape. After the duration is over, you have to uh, keep this edge or track back this edge so that you're able to join these two cutted edge. Now you have to check what is the difference from the length at which you have extended, that means 10. And what length now you have got, let's suppose that is X. So the elastic recovery will be 10 minus X upon 10. Then the next test is the frost baking point. So this is the test to characterize the binder at negative or lower temperature. So here you are going to formulate or make a very thin film of the binder. Here, this figure shows this thin film. So you are going to make a very less or thin film of the binder. You will load it in the frost baking operators and then you will freeze it. Now this freezing will require some standard load of cooling. Now at certain certain temperature or certain certain intervals, you need to flex your this beam. When you will flex it, that means if you bend this sheet of thin film of the binder, it could, it can break, maybe from the middle or maybe from any position, it can break. The temperature at which you find the first crack occurred, that temperature would be taken as the frost breaking point. And that is the temperature utilized for characterization and characterizing the lower temperature of the binder now in case of polymer modified binder. So these were the tests should conducted on the unaged binder. Then there are set of tests which should be conducted on the short term aged binder. So this is the process we have already covered. So the one major test which is required to done or done is G star by sine delta that should be done on RTFOA sample and its value should not should be greater than this 2.2 kappa. And then the other important test or the same most important test is MSCR. This test name is MSCR, which uh, is actually multiple stress creep recovery. So here, uh, this is a, actually a modification of creep test. So whenever you will apply some load and you remove the load, the binder will not come or will not get its original, original position while well, there will be some residual strain remaining. If you try to apply that load uh, more and more time, there will be accumulation of this residual strain inside the material or inside the binder. So here in this MSCR test, we will try to capture that unrecoverable strain uh, in the binder. Here, two type of tests should be used. Uh, one unit is 0.1 kappa, oh, sorry, 0 0.1 kappa and second load is uh, 3.2 kappa. This is very high load as compared to the load or the uh, label of stress we are using at, when we are testing G star and delta. So that's why I was telling that in G star and delta, whatever the parameter we have that will not work uh, or that G star sine delta is not correlating with the field performance. But here, because we are using a high uh, load label here, they are, uh, they can be more correlated with the performance uh, which occurs in the field. So here, this test will have a repetition of load and the rest period, load and the rest period. So here, for one second, you will load your material 
and then for uh, then for 9 second you will make your material rest again this will go on till 10 cycles of 0.1 kepa load and again this 10 cycles of 3.2 kepa load so this is the test actually so here you can see this is the peak strain applied this is the amount of strain recovered and this is the unrecovered strain so after each cycle or after each loading cycle there will be accumulation of this unrecovered strain two parameters can be measured using this test one is jnr and second is jnr difference so this jnr is actually the ratio between the unrecovered strain upon the applied stress and jnr difference is actually the jnr measured when you are applying 3.2 kepa load jnr uh, minus jnr measured when you are applying 0.1 kepa load upon the jnr measured at 0.1 kepa load so this will give you the jnr difference these two parameter will be used uh, in binder grading the third label of aging that is a uh, using pressure aging vessel will require testing binder in dsr and here all the testing we have done in dsr previous to this test will require different geometry that geometry is actually a plate of uh, 25 uh, and a gap of 1 mm now this will require a different geometry a plate of 8 mm and a gap of 2 mm so this criteria or this g star delta should be less than uh, for a PEB is binder sample should be less than 6000 kp. So these are the different set of experiment which is being required to grade your binder or modified binder as per I standard. Now let's see what are the different grades of binder we have and how uh, these tests uh, uh, will require to grade your binder. So we have now as per the present code or the latest code that is IS15462019 we have five different grades of polymer modified binder. Here no CRMB binder now, because for CRMB we are expecting a new code, maybe soon, maybe after three, four, or maybe within the six months we'll see, uh, see a new code for CRMB binder. So at present discussion, I'm just discussing about this polymer modified binders. So we have a binder grade PMB 6010, PMB 7010, PMB 7610, PMB 82 minus 10 or PMB 76 minus 22. Uh, uh, here, this temperature is the maximum temperature and this temperature is the minimum temperature of the area where this binder can be used. So this maximum temperature from where uh, this minimum temperature is coming from this frost baking point. And this maximum temperature is coming from the MSCR test and the complex modulus, these tests. Okay, so this is the main test which will give you the maximum temperature. And this frost baking point is the test which will give you the minimum temperature. And these are all the tests which you need to conduct on a sample which is unaged. So other tests which will be required are the softening point, elastic recovery, flash point, viscosity at 150 degrees Celsius using rotational viscometer, then complex modulus uh, divided by the sine delta, that is the G star sine delta. And that's at a different, different temperature you have to test and its value should be within this range. And then phase angle, then the separation test, uh, on the uh, then softening point from the separation, the sample obtained from the separation test and then frost baking point. So these are the many tests and these all criteria should be satisfied in order to grade the binder at a particular grade level. Okay. So then the next stage of test or, uh, will be on the sample which are short term age or the sample obtained from RTF 40 so these are the tests. First is the loss in mass. So if you age your sample, there will be loss in volatile element and that loss, how much loss is there, that uh, should, uh, this criteria should be uh, satisfied. Then you need to measure the complex modulus on that sample. 
and its value should be minimum 2.2 kappa and then you will do the MSCR test. The value of J and R 3.2 and J and R N difference will be required. And you need to measure these values at these different temperatures to grade the binder at, different, at a certain level. So suppose uh, you are doing a test at 60, uh, 64 or 70 degrees Celsius and you are getting this parameter that these parameters are within this range, then you can only say that binder is of grade 64 or 70. Similarly, based on different traffic label, there are different JNR criteria available or given in the code. One test, only one test is required to then on the PAVA sample and that is G star sine delta, that is a fatigue parameter. And this should be done using eight plate, eight mm plate and two mm gap geometry. Uh, and the value should be uh, 6000 kappa if you run this test at these temperatures. So for uh, a binder grade of 64, you should run this test at 31 degrees Celsius temperature and the value of G star sine delta should be not more than 6000 kappa. So these are the different tests to uh, grade your modified binder as per IS gradation. Now, how we will select that which grade of binder is required at what place? Let's take an example of Delhi. So in Delhi, which grade of binder is required? So in order to do that, there is one temperature equation uh, developed and that temperature equation will help you to take the maximum and minimum temperature. So this is the equation. And this is actually the temperature or the maximum temperature what you see is the maximum average temperature of the pavement. And that should be measured below 20 mm of your pavement depth. So that this is the equation which will give you the value. So this equation is actually dependent upon the air temperature and upon the latitude of the uh, area. <clears throat> so let's try to do this for Delhi. So for Delhi, the high air temperature is 48 degrees Celsius and the latitude is 28.7 degrees Celsius. So if you input these two values in this equation, you will get the maximum pavement temperature or F sorry, I need to, I should call it average maximum pavement temperature. That's will comes out to be 69.7 degrees Celsius. Now, if you have 69.7 degrees Celsius, let's go quickly go to our grade table. So we have 64, we have PMB 70. So we don't have in between grade. So we require by just looking on the maximum grade, we require a PMB. 70 binder for sure. Now let's calculate the minimum temperature. So the minimum temperature actually, whatever the minimum air temperature is that there in that zone that will be taken as the minimum pavement temperature. So that is in case of Delhi, that temperature is recorded as three degrees Celsius. So that minimum temperature will be three degrees Celsius taken. So the grade what we have seen 70 minus 10 PMB that can be used in Delhi. So the grade table because of the temperature range, we can select this grade. Now this grade or selection of the grade just not only depend upon the maximum and minimum temperature, but also depend upon what type of traffic you have. Let's suppose based on the temperature, I selected that 70 and minus 10 uh, grade PMB is uh, good enough for the Delhi. But in that area, I found out that there is a very high or extremely high traffic. So that extremely high traffic, we need to satisfy this criteria. 
and if this child area is full not fulfilled by this 70 minus 10 binder then we can uh, take the higher grade of the binder so based on the traffic jumping the grade is known as grade bumping so based on this two criteria you have to select the pop proper grade for your zone so in order to select that you require the pavement temperature or the air temperature and latitude and then you require what type of traffic or what is the label of traffic you have at that zone these both input will require to select a proper grade for the area now again if we see in this testing or in this code so the minimum temperature is dependent or it's based on the value you obtain from the frost baking point. Now this frost baking point is not a good test. It is not correlated, it's not, simula it's not simulating anything in the field and its correlation with the field thermal cracking is really, really poor. So the, con uh, the conceptualization of the minimum temperature on the basis of frost baking point is not a good thing. Instead, there are more capable tests available, which could be taken into account while taking this low temperature performance. Apart from that, we have seen two different type of codes, two grade modified and unmodified binder. And I already inform you that one more type of code we are going to see maybe in the sixth month that will be for CRMB. Now, whenever we are using any material, what we require is the performance. So why can't we make a code which should depend upon the performance only? That means we require this much performance or this much of G star by sine delta or just this much of JNR value, regardless whatever you have done while producing the binder which is happening in the case of super pave binder grading in states. So soon we are heading on the that way only. So maybe after uh, two, three more years, we'll get a code which is purely based on the performance rather than having different, different code based on the different additives or material what we are using. And it has one more added example. When a manufacturer or producer is producing a binder, they may not have to think about which kind of additive we are doing. Like if a manufacturer is producing a binder, it, is, it has used an elastomer, it will be a polymer modified binder. He doesn't use, then it will be a VG30. And if he use a crumb rubber or a natural rubber, it will be a crumb rubber modified binder. So based on what he has used, the binder is changed and the different core, or different regulations will be required to grade that binder. So instead what can be done, a uniform grade system can be taken, which, is, which should be based on the performance. That means this performance should be achieved whatever the way or whatever the additive you have used in order to modify. That will be a uniform uh, and uh, robust code for grading the binder in India. So I'm, I'm just waiting about that kind of grade and maybe, maybe uh, in the uh, near future, soon we'll be able to see that kind of grading criteria or that kind of grading code for India. So that's it for my side. So now if you have any questions, we can take up. Well, thank you, Dr. Priyansh, for such a wonderful lecture. I, I, indeed, I enjoyed this lecture. You know, I was all there for uh, one hour. I really enjoyed it, you know. And of course, this is the first time I'm listening to you. So this was very, very impressive. From <laughs> It was a great lecture. So thank I you. would request uh, uh, the participants. Yeah, a uh, few of the participants have started texting. Uh, sir, if you can see the chat box, maybe I'll help you in reading out if you want. So it, the first question is by Darshan K. Uh, and it says that, sir, which type of instruments or models are helpful to measure the flexible pavement temperature, air or surface in the bracket they have? Uh, actually, this uh, pavement temperature is, uh, means, uh, <laughs> I will say, a little complex topic because um, the type of data set we are maintaining here in India is, is uh, not good because we have only the metrological uh, data related to the temperature, what we use for the payment design as well. That's why we require this kind of model. 
but actually if you go to the other country other advanced country they have the systematic way systematic uh, grading of the temperature equipment which can be used to measure payment temperature that can be done in india also but here that amount of resources what we have that restricts us so uh, actually this model is actually nothing but a empirical model used they have used a very big data set to calibrate that model so that's it so whatever the temperature you are getting from the meteorology department that temperatures they have just calibrated to obtain this payment temperature sir uh, uh, two of the participants have raised their hands uh, first is mr ujwal solanki uh, uh, ujwal solanki ji we have unmuted yourself i mean then you can please uh, go ahead and ask the question thank you sir sir uh, my question i have earlier also asked sir in a bituminous uh, test when we test the bitumen for viscosity absolute viscosity at that time we use the kenan manning tube as you have shown in the uh, mm. so there is a two bulb bulb b and bulb c yes so we denote the both the time and we have both the calibrated factor and yes. you like that then viscosity two viscosity is available yes so, uh, our is doesn't say which viscosity should be reported actually But, uh, i got your question yes. so actually uh, that two bulbs ideally if all testing uh, is correct and in most ideal condition you should exactly get the same viscosity from both the bulbs oh Okay, okay. so because there are error, and uh, in order to make more, more accuracy, you have to take the average of these two bulbs. Okay, okay. okay. Normally, supplier says that you need to do average, but ASTM says that whatever the bulb get the time more than sixty second first, hmm. time need to be considered. Hmm. But, so actually, this uh, depend upon the code also. So this is applicability code to ASTM as per Indian. It's better if you have the averaging thing. Okay. Although these all tubes and these all calibration constants are the manufacturer specific. Yes. So if manufacturer is saying during when he is supplying the tubes, then go whatever the manufacturer is saying. Uh, so there is next question by uh, the last Patil ji. I think it's Dr. Patil. Maybe he has asked the question in the earlier uh, session also. Yes. Uh, sir, go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you, Ankit ji. Uh, sir i would like to ask one question yes please uh, so we are using the uh, viscometers for finding out the viscosity okay at the ug level we people are using the tar viscometer sebald viscometer yes yes uh, also some people are using this uh, canon manning reverse capillary flow type viscometers yes so and uh, some people are suggested that we can go for the uh, brookfield viscometer or the rotational viscometer so which is the best one sir from the practical point of view so that we can get the uh, actually let's let's not say it like best method because uh, every instrument have some restrictions uh, with it yeah. uh, like sebold viscometer if you talk about so uh, for binders especially if uh, binders temperature is very less so you cannot test its viscosity by using sebold the same it, it is actually usable when you want to uh, measure the viscosity of emulsions yeah in rotational viscometer you can measures the binder viscosity at some temperature range but you cannot measure the uh, emulsions viscosity yeah, yeah yeah in the capillary viscometer you can measure the viscosity at 60 degree celsius that you cannot do with the rotational viscometer yeah. so every instrument actually has a limitation associated with that so depending upon what is my uh, purpose of testing we need to select the equipment Okay. For gradation purpose, we are using this Canon Manning type. Yes, for gradation purpose, we should use uh, this Canon Manning. Okay. All the viscosity is a fundamental quantity, so whatever the testing methodology uh, present, that should not affect the grading. Yeah, yeah. So whatever the test methodology you take, the grade, uh, the viscosity value uh, should be same. And many times we found that, sir, while uh, finding out the ductility value of the bitumen. so at the catenary is form and it touches the bottom of the bath mm. we need for most of the cases mm. and so that that actually happens when you don't have the amount of water uh, or don't have the stirring of the water properly as specified in the code so mm. while you are doing this test you need to maintain the height of the water perfectly there mm. should be no perfect vibration occurring so these all things you should uh, take into the account while doing this test okay. thanks so there is one more question uh, from
Karanjeet Kaur ji. Uh, I think uh, the question is very informative session. Okay. What are the test temperature to start MS, MSCR test? So actually, as per Indian standards is concerned, you have to do the MSCR test at all five temperature at which Indian uh, grade uh, polymer modified binder occur. So you have to check it at 64, 70, 76, 82, and again 76. So at four temperatures, 64, 70, 76, and 82, these will be the four temperatures at which uh, we should run MSCR as per Indian standard. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think, sir, that's it. Uh, let me check if there are some more questions, if they are raising their hands. Uh, and wait for 10 seconds. Okay, I believe, sir, that's it. Uh, so with this, sir, I think uh, uh, my heartfelt thanks to you, sir, uh, because in spite, despite of your busy schedule, you could find time to grace this FTP. And uh, of course, thanks for sharing your knowledge with all the participants across India, I would say. And once again, thank you, sir. We will wait for your other similar talks and lectures at IIT Jammu in the near future. And of course, your constant support to the new budding IIT of uh, Jammu. And I would as, uh, say that even IIT Indore and Jammu, we need uh, constant support of each other to grow together and uh, you know show ourselves uh, uh, presence across India. Thank you so much, thank sir. You. Thank you so much, sir, for inviting me and giving me the audience because for teacher not is audience is a problem. So giving me the audience. <laughs> thank Absolutely. you so much. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, to the participants. Uh, so this is the end of the today's uh, uh, lectures. Again, tomorrow. Uh, at 10 a.m. we'll be meeting for the next lecture which is on recycling of bituminous pavement and that lecture will be given by Dr. Professor G.D. Ransing Chung from IIT Roorkee. Okay, uh, so he has vast experience of working on recycling of bituminous pavements. So hoping to meet you tomorrow again with the same presence, with the same attendance and uh, and uh, no, I would I would uh, specifically mention here that uh, participants are taking very good interest, and it is directly, uh, you know, uh, uh, shown by the type of questions that are coming out. So thank you all, and uh, see you again tomorrow at 10 a.m. Maybe we can join at 9:50 a.m. just to respect the uh, speaker. Thank you all. <laughs>